Smith was born in Buffalo, New York. She lives and works in Houston, where she is a, where she is a practicing visual artist and a fine arts educator. She studied at Rice University and the Maryland Institute College of Art before receiving her Bachelor's of Arts degree from Sarah Lawrence College, and then her Master's of Fine Arts degree from Syracuse University. Kanim's work has been included in numerous venues such as Art Pace San Antonio, the African American Museum in Dallas, the Arts League Houston, the Station Museum of Contemporary Art, Grounds for Sculpture in Hamilton, New Jersey, the Amarillo Museum of Art, the National Art Gallery in Athens, Greece, the Lima Art Museum in Peru, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And among her many accomplishments, exhibitions, awards, and residencies, uh, Kanim was the recipient of a Visual Arts Fellowship through the Edward F. Albee Foundation, the Vermont Studio Center, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation, Artadia, and the Creative Capital Foundation in New York. Um, and on a personal note, I've known Kanim's work uh, a long time. I think we calculated going back to, I want to say 2007. Yeah. Yes, since that's we right. Were, when, since we were toddlers. And, um, and so it really is a special honor. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Kaneem Smith. Thank you. So Kaneem, um, first off, thanks, thank you for being here at MCA Denver. Um, we're so pleased to have you here. And um, this is a special opportunity um, where you have carefully selected um, some expert excerpts from your practice, so not the full scope, but uh, with a particular mind towards works of art that would help us uh, more deeply understand your sculpture on view. Um, so I, th I thought I'd begin by asking you to sort of introduce us to your practice and the general goals and ten tenets of your work. Okay. Um, first and foremost, Miranda, thank you so, so much. I'm honored to have been uh, brought here asked to be here to do this. Um, thanks to you and your amazing staff for the, just, I, I just arrived here yesterday and just, just since coming here yesterday, you've all been amazing and very accommodating and um, being in Denver just even a day, it's just been, it's just been great. Um, it's significantly colder here than it is in Houston, of course. <laughs> But, and then the altitude is much higher, but it's really wonderful to be here. I've been, yeah, it's been, I really, I really appreciate it. And I, I'm thankful to you all coming out here tonight. Thank you for coming. Awesome. Thank you. Well, yeah, we'd love to see um, some slides of your work. And yeah, just acknowledging we're definitely higher and drier than our days yes. in Houston. And it's, it's really nice to see some snow as well. It's been a really long time <laughs> since I've seen <laughs> snow. Um, I am, uh, my background, I've, I've, I'm going to say mixed media, primarily uh, with a primary interest in fiber-based works. And when I say fiber-based works, I really have uh, a love of working with uh, raw organic materials such as cotton and burlap and uh, beeswax and, and natural materials and incorporating them and bringing them together. Uh, and with some inorganic materials as well to express my interests and to, um, I guess, uh, from, uh, it's not only just to express my interests, but I guess share uh, my personal vision, my background, but also makes works that are uh, historical or bring, bring attention to uh, marginalized people, ideas, um, things that are little known facts or uh, information that maybe isn't as widely known about um, certain histories that are connected to artists of color, particularly African-American artists, African-American people. Um, the first piece that I'm, that I'm sharing here on the screen, uh, when I was a, an, an undergraduate student and just uh, figuring, um, exploring and figuring out what I wanted to do, I, I knew that I was interested in doing something that brought attention or my interest towards learning more about the history of the transatlantic slave trade 
and wanted to do something visual of that. No, I'm not the first one to do it or the last, but I wanted to do it in such a way that uh, was utilizing materials I'm interested in and doing in a way that was very sort of poet, poetic and, uh, and, memor and, and sort of like memorializing it in some way rather than, uh, although it has the stark history to it, I wanted to use materials that were, uh, that were inviting and tactile and and I wanted to show works tonight that are connected to, um, that I feel like have a connection to the veil, to the piece that's here in the Dirty South exhibition. This piece here um, is actually made with, it is cotton, but it's a different type of cotton. I actually, so as a student, just working with what I had around me uh, as an undergraduate student, materials I had just found, um, that's basically like a cotton upholstery batting from an old couch because back then, you know, I, I, just, I was just, I knew I wanted to work with certain material and I was working with what I had available to me. And I uh, just started working with and playing with, uh, with beeswax, went into the art supply store as a student, picked up uh, a container of it and smelled it and just thought, wow, this is really wonderful. I want to work with this. And... I didn't want to be literal or figurative with uh, creating this piece. So instead of actually putting a representational person in place of the individual, I wanted to use uh, like a, a leaf form or an organic shape. And uh, it's all, it's carved in, in beeswax. So it's sort of like this organic leaf or vessel form in beeswax. So up close, you see a close up. So you're looking at uh, and, and how do I make it more human? I want it, so I actually carved um, uh, a spinal, sort of like a, a human spinal cord in each of them. Uh, so instead of using, or, or maybe, you know, casting a human form or something representational in the beeswax, I wanted something that I felt was more poetic uh, in approach and this was sort of the genesis of me wanting to work with these ideas and um, continue to explore the mediums as well as I was, I was working with. My earliest inspiration as an undergraduate student came from going to the library, exploring things, and I came across this, uh, an article in uh, this magazine about the uh, African burial ground in New York City underneath Wall Street. And around that time, it had, uh, they were doing some um, they were doing some excavation, excavation in, on the Wall Street area because they were going to uh, build new buildings. They were going to do more building on that site, and they started digging up bones. Bones started coming up out of the excavation, and so they stopped and uh, began the exploration of where this had come from. And it turned out that these were. Um, bodies of enslaved people underneath Wall Street, like around, like more than 200 bodies had been discovered. And I was very, very interested in this. I wanted to, um, I think it was, uh, was it 1993? Yeah, it was 93, yeah. I was at Sarah Lawrence College, and I wanted to figure out a way to get involved in this project somehow. And as an art student, I actually, and, and at the time, it was located in the World Trade Center in New York, in Tower Two, and I called the office, and at the time it was called the OPEI, the Office of Public Education and Interpretation for the African Burial Ground Project. I called the office and I spoke with the staff, and they said they didn't necessarily have uh, an internship program, but I wanted to figure out a way that I can get involved and just come out there and. Um, you know, and have it be part of my education. And I was able to, um, through Sarah Lawrence, I was able to apply for a small grant through my, prog through my program in order to um, travel back and forth from Sarah Lawrence College, which is in Bronxville, New York, down to uh, Manhattan once a week. So the funding provided the train ticket for me to go back and forth once a week for a semester. And it turned out, which turned out to be a year. And 
and basically lunch. So basically, so this had been come up, become part of my education. In fact, um, I was able to get college credit from doing this. But it was much more than that. Um, it, it, uh, this, this sort of, it sparked in, in inspiration in me because um, I was able to see some of the remains. Dr. Michael Blakey from Howard University, I got a chance to meet him. He was the professor from, uh, from Howard in Washington, D.C. that was involved in this project at the time of wanting to study these bones. And the, at the time, the remains that had come out were temporarily stored at Howard. And um, some of them were also in New York, so I was able to see some of those remains. I was able to take some photographs. And um, that was sort of the genesis. It's almost like it sort of, those remains sort of spoke to me and I felt like, I felt compelled to begin to do more with this. I, I felt like this is the direction I need to go in. This is what I want to do. This is, this is, this is the kind of work I want to make. It's almost like an ancestral thing sort of speaking to me where I was being led to, uh, to bring attention, to bring awareness to these unknown, these unnamed individuals uh, to bring about attention and to memorialize these unnamed people, uh, bring dignity and, uh, and uh, sort of preserve their memory and, and, uh, of, these, uh, of these bodies, of these, of these individuals. And even though we didn't know very much about them through uh, the archeologists that worked on the project, studying the teeth and the bones, they were able to find, you know, obviously they found out, uh, they were able to discover things about them. But I was just so inspired as an artist and as, a, um, as an African-American, I was just inspired just in general, just as a human being, just, just wanting to do something more than just uh, be there as an intern. And I, the other thing I d probably didn't mention even to Miranda is that what was my job there? I was making illustrations of what some of these people might have looked like. Oh. That's kind of, this is kind of the genesis of how I started as an, as an artist, as a student. Mm -hmm. And years later, as an undergrad towards my uh, senior year of, of college, uh, I got an opportunity to, uh, there's, an, there's, a, there's an, you know, I, as, an, as a young person, I was applying for things where, um, applying, applying for opportunities to, um, to show my work or to be in shows, and I heard about the Carol Harris Sims um, National Black Art Exhibition, or a competition that was in Dallas, Texas at the time, at the African American Museum in Dallas. And the grand prize, if you, if you you know, if you were so lucky to win the competition, first and second place, you were able to, uh, the museum uh, purchased one of your works that you submitted, but also you got opportunity to have an exhibi exhibition, exhibition in the space. And so that's what you're seeing here. I wanted to show this because this is sort of like, a, again, sort of like the beginning of, the jumping off point of the kind of work I do now. This is, this is where it's all coming from. Working with beeswax, working with, uh, with cotton and working with uh, organic materials and bringing these things together to talk, to, uh, talk about like transatlantic slave trade and also to talk about, uh, I guess talk about my own family, my own familiar background um, and in relationship to the dirty South, even though I was born in Buffalo, New York, my parents my mother's, my mother's roots are in uh, North Carolina. My father's are in South Carolina, in Barbados. And just, and, and so those are the roots that, those are, those are like my roots. But also, obviously, Buffalo, New York is my roots, but um, my southern roots come obviously from them. So, but if someone has a question about this later on, we can talk about it more. I, uh, but I have a lot of slides to show. And so I, I want to get to a point where Miranda and I can talk about how we met. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm so glad you showed those works because I think it makes clear how you've long used materials with historical significance mm -hmm. in your practice. And that definitely manifests in the sculpture. But also, I love how you make history feel personal. 
because of the reference to actual bodies and actual people, you know, you make it come alive in that way. And you help us relate to, you know, the lives of people long past. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk about this work, Forsaken Eulogies and Difference. Um, so this was, uh, uh, when I was just a curatorial assistant at the Manila Collection, um, which is a beautiful uh, museum in Houston, uh, I was working under Franklin Sermons, who's now director of the Perez Art Museum in Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my first projects uh, writing was when, was meeting you, Kanim, and getting to know the work that you were doing um, with this project, which is an incredible project that brings to light a really important and not unknown, at the time, unknown history in Houston. Yeah, so this is, so I am jumping a bit forward. Um, 2005, when I got out of graduate school, moved back to Houston, Texas, I, um, uh, you know, wanting to find my way, getting my, getting my feet wet back home, um, beginning to uh, exhibit my work locally and began to show my work in galleries and just trying to create opportunities for myself. I started applying for grants, one of which was the Creative Capital Grant, the Individual Artist Grant. And my proposal was basically my back, what was happening in my backyard. I lived in a, a building um, which was an old, uh, it's called the old, it was basically the Jefferson Davis Hospital. It's one of our uh, the historic building in Houston that had been um, renovated to become live work artist space for art for local artists and creative people in Houston. That could, you could rent these spaces, they were affordable, and the building, there was all, there were these rumors that the building was haunted because before it had been renovated um, by an, art, uh, an, the, um, an organization called Art Space out of Minneapolis and Avenue CDC, the Community Development Corporation in Houston, that, that uh, develops affordable housing for Houstonians. Uh, they came together and put up the funding to renovate, renovate the building itself. And I got an opportunity to move into the building and a national public, I know there's national public radio affiliate in Denver, the national public radio NPR in Houston. I was listening to a radio program and they were talking about uh, the Old City Cemetery in Houston. And the Old City Cemetery was connected to one of, uh, it, was, it was an old veteran cemetery, and a small portion of it was the old, what was called the Old Negro Cemetery, and, it, and which is probably a little, this was a little known fact, but it is, a, an, it is in the historical records, it is in the older maps of the city of Houston, so the, the information is there, it's just not necessarily public. And when I was listening to this program and they, and they uh, talked about the location, I realized that it was just behind the building I was living in was where the Negro Cemetery was. And I knew that I was living on top of a cemetery, but I didn't really know what kind. And so that was just, I was just absolutely floored by that. But the, the, it should be noted that it was all, you were also living in a former Jefferson Davis hospital. And that's hospital, another thing, Confederate, right. Confederate hospital. So it's like, it's, which is, yeah. yeah, ironic in itself. Yeah. So there was obviously a monument for the hospital, for the, for, for that, for, for the Jefferson Davis, uh, for Jefferson Davis and for the veteran cemetery, but there was nothing for the old Negro cemetery. In fact, there was no information on it. And so as an artist, I, I developed a proposal where, and then, oh, and also part of the radio program was talking about that this wasn't, this was just one of 30 known um, dilapidated um, uh, form, uh, basically, uh, I should say, uh, I don't want to say Negro, but I use that word. Formerly black, basically, uh, African American cemeteries in Houston, um, and they were disappearing, and that's really what the story was about. The fact that the areas were being gentrified, and buildings were being the buildings were being developed right on the top of these cemeteries, because it was public property. Mm -hmm. And um, so, what I wanted to do, what my what my uh, proposal was about, was wanting to memorialize these sites. Uh, by creating uh, 
or a series of earthworks at each of these sites. And there are a few others in Houston that still exist. They're not in the best condition, and there's a lot of development happening in Houston. Houston's growing like crazy, and there's people moving to Houston all the time from all over the world. And what's happening is that there's this encroachment of historical land that's just getting built on. And I wanted to create something so that people would know that these cemeteries existed where they were and to sort of bring attention to them. And so what, I, what my proposal was about was making these earthworks. And so basically these are, so it's 30 for the 30 known cemeteries representing each of the cemeteries, so it's 30 uh, coffins, basically vessel coffin, uh, vessel-shaped coffins, forms out of welded steel, and I wanted to create sort of a nautilus formation. I wanted, so I, uh, so I wanted, to, so I basically placed them in such a way that they sort of spiraled and sort of came out from that. And, I wanted to place it on the land. So that's where the Creative Capital Grant came about. The, the tricky part is that once that was put together, and then there's a, there's a couple other cemeteries I wanted to work with, um, there are organizations in Houston that want to uh, historically like memorialize these sites also, but it's not always easy working with um, other grassroots organizations in Houston because they had their own ideas, in fact, and it's almost like I was being pushed out of what they wanted to do. And so even though, so the, being that this piece had existed and still exists, and thank God it's still there, um, to this day I haven't been able to realize all the rest of them. But that's my goal mm -hmm. still, all these years later. Because this was, so this was created and interred in 2007, and it's been there since then. And it's now 2023, mm -hmm. and because of black roads that I had come across and politics and red tape, I haven't yet been able to develop the other spaces as of yet. Wow. But that's still a goal of mine I mean, at some goal. point. But goal. the fact that this is here, yeah. It's really wonderful. And the connection with Miranda is that um, part of my proposal and part of the, uh, what you had to do with the money is that you had to have a public program, a presentation. Mm -hmm. You had to have something where they, to engage the public, to engage the community. And so I wanted to create a brochure and Miranda did a wonderful essay for that brochure. Oh, I was super honored. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, that's where that came from. And that's how we met. That's how we met, yeah. Um, so I feel like this kind of I feel like this work kind of is a good segue to also how you there's certain materials and certain forms that you return to in your sculpture because of their historical significance. And mm -hmm. so I'd love to ask you about your use of cotton in the work and also because um, I know you have some fantastic slides. I'd love to ask you about your use of burlap. Um, um, also, as an undergraduate student, uh, came across. Uh, basically reclaimed, uh, they, were, they were throwing away these, uh, these coffee bags, these old burlap bags, I saw them, I cut them up, I opened them up, I saw them as an opportunity of material I could work with. I really just sort of fell in love with the material. Burlap was not easy to work with, um, and I know that's personally my opinion, it's just that um, I, I'm, I love, it's organic, I love the way it smells, I, I but it's just more than that. I love um, the, the color, the texture of it, but also uh, the bag. I started to really look at these bags and I started to think about who created these bags and what they were used for, uh, for coffee, for trade, uh, and that they would come from all different parts of the world. I had bags, I was, um, I, got, I gathered bags from Mexico, from Asia, uh, from Africa, from Ethiopia, which was a lot of the bags came from Ethiopia, which is the root of coffee itself. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I started working with burlap um, early on, and I saw it as a sculptural material that I could, uh, that I really just fell in love with, I wanted to work with. It spoke to me, and um, I wanted to create uh, works that had volume and presence and scale, but not necessarily physical weight. And I had spent some time in, um, in Africa when I graduated from undergraduate school. It was either, that was like my gift from my parents, we'll help you buy a car or you'll be able to travel to Africa. Oh, wow. So that I, I took the travel to Africa because I felt like, I could, you know, I'll be without a car for a while, but this is a once in a lifetime yeah. opportunity. Yeah. And when I was in West Africa um, in the Ivory Coast, I got an opportunity to see uh, uh, the the so one of the uh, one of the uh, the communities there the Baule people of, of Cote d'Ivoire the French word for Ivory Coast the Baule people I got to spend time in those villages and they lived in mud huts and the mud huts were very much the color of the burlap and I, that just sort of resonated with me because I wanted to I was thinking architecturally wanting to make things like that but the weight, the size, and I didn't know how I was going to do something like that, so I saw this as an opportunity to create something like that of scale. Um, and so this was one of the early works I had done like that. It's quite large, uh, hand-stitched, that's another thing I was doing. I wanted, I was, I was doing everything by hand at the time. And uh, so this particular work is actually, it memorializes, uh, so, and also, Going back to the, um, the project that I mentioned, Forsaken Eulogies project, memorials, um, wanting to create works that memorialized um, certain things or people. Um, I don't know if you all, you might, and several of you, if not everyone in here might know who John, the, the artist John Biggers is. He's actually in this show. John Biggers. Um Incredi one, yeah. Incredible Houston artist um, who, yeah, does powerful figurative work. Yeah. Yeah. And ta ta taught at Texas a &M. Taught at, taught at well, Texas Southern so, University. Sorry, Texas Southern. Texas yes, Southern sorry. University in yes. Houston. Yeah. And his colleague was uh, another great artist of note, which, is, which was, who was lesser known, but just as amazing. His name was Carol Harris Sims. And I wanted to create something in his honor. So I had an exhibition where I, I made this piece and I wanted it, so it's probably, you're looking at probably maybe 12 feet in height and at least 12 feet in height. I wanted something that really, because he, he was a big man, he was like this gentle giant, a big gentleman, uh, butter brown skin, and that's another thing, the, the burlap, uh, the color, it just, it just felt right, it resonated. And I felt like it was his presence in the gallery. I wanted to create something in his honor. So this is a memorial for Carol Harris Sims. And I, not only did I co co uh, connect the bags and stitch the bags together, I also began what I consider sort of this raised stitch sculpting technique I began doing on the bags. And what's on the bags are designs and patterns that Carol Harris Sims often used in his work. And actually, he was a ceramic artist. He was a ceramic sculptor. And his works are still at, on campus at Texas Southern University in the University Museum. So students learn and know about him, but he, doesn't, he never got the attention that John Biggers got, mm -hmm. even to this day. So that's something that I felt was important to kind of honor him and bring attention to him in this exhibition that I had put together. Um, again, doing other works that, uh, that are memorials, working with the burlap material. Um, at the time, this is, uh, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, an artwork that I created, a 21-foot suspended pipe with burlap sacks that I, uh, that I sort of, that are, that are fairly crude in the way they look, but they're actually, that, they're actually vests and the vests are modeled after the vests that uh, women wore in the, in the factories in Juarez, Mexico, because this, this is a memorial piece that had to do with the women that were being murdered that's still happening out even now in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this piece is about. Not to, get in, not to spend too much time on it, 
but that's what this piece is about. So it's, it's this row of vests on this rack, uh, and it's this, uh, so it's this, uh, but, and, and even, even though it looks the way it does, there's something about, it has this striking presence when people would encounter it and they'd find out what it was. So that's what this piece was about. These, this is burlap, um, so these burlap vests, I coated them in wax and I um, suspended them from this pipe. So it's almost like a, a clothing rack with these vests and each vest re represents an individual that was murdered in Mexico. This is a piece that I created with burlap uh, years later, so I'm jumping, but I'm just giving you an idea of things I had done over the years working with this material. Found bags, uh, I, I spent a lot of time, many, several years collecting these bags, different coffee houses and people donating donations, things that I found in the trash. And I uh, got an opportunity to travel to Germany and inside, it's called the Monk's Church Gallery. It's in Salzfedel in East Germany between Hamburg and Berlin. And I got an opportunity to travel out there to um, build what I could, what, what, I, what I created sort of a chapel within there, within the space. So this is old monk's church that was converted into a gallery in the space. And what does the chapel represent? The chapel represents um, um, uh, St. Mauritius, the earliest known black saint in Western culture uh, in Germany, and I wanted to honor him and create a chapel in his honor. And even though I couldn't build it in Magdeburg, where he was originally from, and where his, uh, where his tomb is, and where the sculpture is, where the, uh, uh, where the monument is mm -hmm. of, the, of, of St. Mauritius, um, I was close enough to it where I wanted to create the chapel that I felt like he always should have had. So that's what this piece is. When I do a site-specific work like this, I wanted to connect it and I wanted to marry it to the site. I don't never want to. I never want to bring a work into the site and just plop it in there. I wanted to feel, to really connect and sort of uh, become part of the space that it's in. And these incredible vaulted ceilings. In this in this uh, church gallery, it's just it's just they're just incredible, and I won't get into how, but I but I thank the uh, the uh, the people that worked at the church gallery. They helped me figure out how to sus they helped me with these pipes, figure out how to suspend it. I wanted it to float. I wanted it to be open. I wanted you to, to for the ceiling of the space to become the ceiling of his chapel, and. It's, and, I, and my raised stitches, I wanted to mimic this, the, the lines that you see along the vaulted ceiling. So it's all sort of connected. And many of the bags, not all of them, but many of the bags are actually German coffee bags. So that's also a connection I wanted to make. So not just using just uh, random bags, the bags themselves are connected to the concept behind the work itself. So I wanna make sure that we um, have, talk about the piece on view here in oh, Dirty absolutely. South. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, but I think that use of um, that thoughtfulness towards materials manifests mm -hmm. really And here in another installation. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Here's another one. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to throw in there a couple of pieces because of other things that I, that I do that I don't want to say are equivalent, but similar to what you see in the gallery. Mm -hmm. Prefabricated or found or uh, vintage prefabricated materials mixed with something that I've created. Mm -hmm. And so I have a quilt that I, uh, a remnant of a quilt that I made with uh, a Texas hang, a cotton hanging scale there that's attached to it. I work in other material, other media with the burlap. I had an opportunity, which I, which was I was thrilled about to cast some of my works in bronze and in aluminum metal. And so this is an, this is an example of one of those. And then other works that I make that are, and the colors, textures, things that, that there's a story behind them, quilted works, panels. Uh, oh, actually, we're, we're gonna jump ahead because that's, that's my dad. Okay, so here, gonna, we'll start yeah. here and then I'll go back. Yeah. 
So, so in relationship to what's here in this gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I noticed you use scales in your work uh, in other pieces. Yes. And so um, I, I'd love for you to share a bit about the process of creating this work. And I will share that it's been a very powerful work to show here in Denver. Um, it's a, it, it can, it's definitely has this implication of violence through the scales and aggression and I've noticed that people, you know, they they want to engage with the story. They want to know what the history is about, and sometimes that's been hard for people. And so I'd love, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate yeah. you saying that. And I mm -hmm. definitely want to yeah. hear from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th those that have seen the piece, mm -hmm. what are what are their feelings about it? How you know how mm -hmm. how did they feel approaching it? what are their thoughts about that sort of thing. I would love to know. So, um, and just to sort of backtrack just a tiny bit, I just want to, so in relationship to something like this, if I had an exhibition, I would, uh, this came about because I'll have um, vintage um, prefabricated things and, and cotton and things that are connected to my background and the background of the materials that I work with, because at the root of everything that I do as an, as an artist, it's, it comes from the bale. The cotton is the foundation. And the foundation of the cotton is the bale. And the bale, just it, itself, it symbolizes a dark history that's ever present. So when I say something's perpetual, it was, it is, and it seems like it's, it continues, it will always be. Also, I think about as a material industrially to create something that, that we all, that, that universally, that globally is a commodity that is worn, it comes out of that. People have died because of that. My ancestry comes out of that. And putting this installation so this installation was part of an exhibition where I was sharing with the public, because they would look at my work and go, what is this about? Where is this coming from? It comes from that. So it's bringing prefabricated uh, objects and marrying them with things that I've created. So that's, that's where that came from. So that's what this is. Um, and the bale itself is historical. Yeah. Yeah. And the gentleman that, that, uh, that, uh, that enabled me to show my work at the African American Museum, uh, he's not uh, uh, long retired. His name, was Phil, his name is Philip Collins. He was, a, he was chief curator at the African American Museum for many, in Dallas, Texas, for many, many years. And he gave, he's, I have that bail because of him. He gave me that bail. And so I guess, and, and I apologize for the way I'm rambling, but it just, all of, everything is kind of connected in a way. The works, the materials I use are connected to the people that I have known and the people I've worked with in the past. So that's where that comes from. And the scales uh, were collected. Uh, I found a couple in uh, antique stores in Houston and other parts of Texas, the ones that are centrally located and if you'll notice, the ones on the sides are slightly different, but they're still hanging scales, but they are stockyard scales, and those are from New York State, my birthplace. So it's connecting me, where I was actually born, with Texas, where I actually grew up, where basically it was just part of me as well. Yeah. So it's Texas, it's, so basically, so, yeah. And, and, the, um, and, the, weights them, and the weights that are on the bale, you, I sort of see them as individuals on that placed on that cotton. Yeah. And I also see this as a sarcophagus, as an altar. There's a lot of different interpretations you can make with it when you look at it. But I like that and I want that to resonate with people. Yeah, and we talked about how the presentation, the scale of it changes a little bit every time as far as like this, the space in the room, the, you know. In each of the venues uh, that has been shown in, Mm -hmm. for the Dirty South exhibition. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't mean to skip right over him, but I oh, do no, want to no, 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 no. I do want to no. acknowledge your father, George Smith. <laughs> um, you know, incredible sculptor in his own right. And um, only because I know it's part of who you are as a sculptor and Absolutely. informed your work. I, I just wanted to also make sure we acknowledged him as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I wish my father could have been here today. He is very much alive, but um, um, and he and he would have loved to have been here. His sadly, he has developed some dementia, and he's ill. But so he couldn't. There's no way he could travel here to be here. But he is here, and he's very excited about this whole process. But my father, just the time I was a toddler, watching my dad make things, um, and he was inspired. And this, not to get into what, not to entirely get into who, what he does, but these are, this is just a sampling of some of his works. His works are, he's very different from mine, as you can see. So these are artworks out of welded steel, and they're abstract forms, but they are, he's, he's inspired by the Dogon peoples of Mali and West Africa, and, Afri and West African cosmology. And these artworks have their own stories, but they come out of that out of those concepts. Yeah, and I love that there's relationship, but also your voice is your own as well. Mm -hmm. And you've taken it in a really different direction. So yeah. um, so we just have a few minutes left, but I wanna make sure I leave time also for you to share exciting new things that you're working on and where your practice is going now in the future, and in the future. Absolutely. Um, so in the, next, in the next slide, this is something that I, uh, this, so, what you're looking at is, um, and what I've been working with lately within the past just couple of years have been um, what I call, uh, they're sort of, they're more, uh, uh, they're tapestries, they're burlap based tapestries and they're large scale and I have different fabrics on them. So basically I'm working, so I'm, I'm developing these ideas of bringing more to the material and telling more of a story with, by utilizing other materials on top of the burlap. And I'm just continuing to ev let that evolve and bring other things um, in with it. And what you're seeing here is it's not just random colors, it's not just random uh, fabrics that you're seeing here. Some of these things are workwear that my father, that, that belonged to my father that he used in the studio, um, his old denims, his old workwear, his old duck cotton overalls, but also memorializing or bringing attention to industry in general, uh, the working class uh, industry in terms of uh, people that work in steel yards, uh, work in wood shops, basically wood factories, factory workers. So what you're looking at are factory uniforms uh, and colors and textures that are, uh, that are connected to people um, Basically, uh, basically workwear and uniforms and connecting that also to my father and what he does. But also, it, it and for this particular, um, uh, before this particular project, so this is, this is a commission that I did for United Airlines and it is in the terminal, it's, it's a permanent installation inside the terminal in Houston, Texas at the George Bush Intercontinental Airport. So if you ever go through there, through Houston, you will see this in Terminal C. It's eight foot by 10 foot. And it's, it's a very, an unusual piece because you're not gonna see this in a lot of places because it is, it's a textile work. Right. A public, a work of art, a public art that's textile based. Mm -hmm. And there were con some concerns. How, how can we have this in our space permanently? But it is treated with, um, a fire retardant coating. I know it sounds crazy, but basically, so if something were to happen, it won't catch fire, it will, it will char. So basically I wanted, so, and that's basically the direction I'm going to, doing more public art, doing more things where I can have my work in public spaces like this uh, for people to enjoy on more of a permanent scale, permanent level. And I apologize for the quality of the slide, but the latest thing I've done was a large scale work for Art Pace in San Antonio. And this was in their Window Works Gallery. This is in a narrow space, but it's, uh, I, and I really just, 
I'm really just really thrilled about how, how the way it came out. So it's more, it's more development of me working with the burlap, uh, working with different fabrics that are connected to, um, uh, to industry, to utility, and, um, but also, uh, this, and this, this, and I'm, I'm talking, so basically this one has to do with, uh, Mexico and South America. Why? Because this is a migrant barrier tapestry. And it, not just Mexico and South America, there are, uh, I, and also I did some printing on here, but this is, and it's ironic because I've been doing this, making these, uh, these, uh, these migrant barrier works for several years and thinking about what's happening right now with the migrants, all of the things that are happening right now. It's, all, it's just so ironic that these are things that are still happening, they're happening right now. Mm -hmm. And it just makes, it makes me excited to keep, to keep going with what I'm doing because I always feel like, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Because it's relevant, mm -hmm. even though, you know, even if it's just to myself, but it's, it's relevant, it's, and it's something that's happening now. And the community in San Antonio really, really resonated with, with this. So this is, um, it's a floor to ceiling, flat tapestry work. It's double sided. And it's in a space, it's in a narrow space. The gallery is this narrow sort of long space and it was um, site specific and it was created for this space. And it's also, they, there are, administrative offices behind the space. So I've also wanted to create it where um, people could see it from the street, you can enter the gallery, but also there's plenty of space around it so that the administrators could get to there and the, and the <laughs> director, at the, I guess, the director of uh, Art Pace San Antonio could get to his office and they oh, could get to their offices and they really loved having him in the space. I love it, I love yeah. it. So. A little bit of pragmatism too, right. yeah. But um, but I think actually that sense of relevance and connecting current issues with the past is a great place um, to transition to opening it up for, to questions from the audience. Um, this is um, a great opportunity to, if you have questions about either the work on display or about Kaneem's work in general to ask. Um, but I please join me first in thanking Kaneem for taking us through all the aspects of the practice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. Yes, don't be shy. Sorry, it's hard to put it into words all after we've been taking these in. I was thinking these are enormous pieces of work, and so much of the work is about labor. Yes. And yes. about, in, as you said, industry mm -hmm. and inequity and justice along those lines. Um, I was fascinated to see how the both the bail is both a memorial and an altar as well as the scales being both an echo of industry and of justice. Um, I wondered uh -huh. if you could talk a little bit about either your more contemporary work or other thoughts that you have about how, how justice and, and the exposure of industry, whether your own or the industry of enslaved or other people, um, just continues to resonate in your work. It continues to resonate with my work because of, uh, I, enjoy, I, I enjoy doing a lot of research about history, but also current events. And this, the bail and the title with it. Um, uh, the past is perpetual. Yeah, the past is perpetual, weighted, weighted fleet. fleet. Yeah. Um, and the slash is there because initially, there are two individual pieces brought together because I, 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 had, I had shown the, 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 the scales on their own, the first time I'd shown them on their own without the bail, and that's the weighted fleet, sort of these ships sort of passing, the idea of- Fleet as in fleet yeah, of ships. The fleet yeah. of ships yeah. on the wall, the scales, uh, those sort of, I mean, swords, weapons, whatever uh, people can sort of connect them with. Um, but it's, 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 uh, it's still, it's, it's, I think it's always gonna inspire what I do because it's, it's, it's still happening now, the injustice. Um, there's so many things happening now that, that, um, that, that I just didn't think I would be, 
that I would that I would still be dealing with, even as a, as a woman of color, as an African American, in my lifetime. I just thought, I just I don't know why it sounds naive, but I thought as a child when I grew up, things would get better, and they things have gotten a lot better, but. This is, it's still there. It's still there at the core of the American experience. It's still there and still, yeah, it's still something that I'm building. It's always going to be in the work. And just as a material, the, the, uh, the basis of, so this and the bale, it's, it's very much a raw bale. It's a vintage bale. And this is uh, because uh, how, it's, how bales are produced now, you know, Obviously, there, there's a lot of technology involved now, the way the ginning process um, has definitely been modernized. Um, some bales that are, that are put together are seedless. This is raw, this has the seeds, the dirt, the twigs, everything is in there. And it's just simply bound with, uh, with a rusted, rusted pieces of bale, uh, of steel baling wire, the way it was originally um, done. So, um, to answer your question, um, it continues to inspire me because of current events, because, of, because it's, I, there's so much I can still draw from and work from as an artist. It keeps me engaged. Um, and it keeps me hopeful for things to get better. Thanks, Julie, for For the generation the, not the generation after me, but, the, but even like generations after I'm gone. Yeah, it's some, I'm, I'm hopeful. That's a great question. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, if I heard correctly, I think you mentioned that um, this exhibit changes a little bit at every venue and kind of set yes. it up. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the different formats you've created and yeah. Okay, so based on uh, the space available and what they have to work with, um, I've and I and I wish I had the, I should have put those images in there, but there I have there has been an installation that didn't include the stockyard scales on the side. It was just the the Texas the the scales in the center and just the veil without the weights, um, or just the scales themselves without the veil, but. This is the way I always intended for it to be shown. And also, um, when it was in um, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, it was on a rust wet red wall. The, the wall was painted this beautiful uh, like a, rust like red a, color. Like Georgia clay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That, and also at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, the second venue was in. And then um, at Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas, it was against a white wall, and then now here against a white wall. Mm -hmm. But that's a great question, yeah. Well, Thank you. It's funny, um, it's, since COVID, we've also, as museums, had to get used to installing with artists via Zoom, which uh, Kanim <laughs> very graciously yeah. uh, worked with us on. And it's funny, if you'd asked me five years ago, like, is this gonna become commonplace? And uh, I appreciate that, because I, yeah. I absolutely, you know, being She's micromanaging and want, I wanted to be involved in seeing how it was going to be installed. And, and you all so gracious about it at each of the venues about um, including me in the installation process. No, it's great. Process. It's great. Yeah. I think there's time for one last question. If anyone has one. Yeah. Because of the way of the things and not of yourself that informs your work, is there a personal practice that you have to employ when you feel like you're finally to close off your energy with your piece and then coming into the space today, do you still feel so connected to your energy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great question. I absolutely great question. do. Um, even walking into the space this evening, um, there's almost like this, this vibration that happens uh, when, I'm, when I encounter it, 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 especially at each of the venues. I wasn't, I was, and Part of what's special about being able to be here was that I couldn't be in Bentonville, Arkansas, and I couldn't be in Virginia in the beginning to see the exhibition. Um, but the bale definitely speaks to me. Uh, my, uh, 
my dear aunt had passed away several years ago, and I kind of uh, lovingly named the veil Betty. So it's sort of when I when I whenever I get a chance to see Betty, to be in the space with Betty, it's really wonderful. She's I say she, but it's sort of like this. I don't know, there's sort of this motherly presence about the bale sitting there in space. But I definitely am very curious, because I also know, I'm also aware of the fact that some people are very disturbed by the piece as well at several of the venues, and I just wanted to, I hadn't had a chance to connect or hear from those people, and I didn't know if there was anyone in the room that was brave enough to say, well, you know, I, I felt a certain way when I encountered it, but I would love to hear that. Yes. The first time I saw the, the gallery was really beautiful, really I couldn't really see what was happening. There were so many people, but I thought it was stone. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and just the way that the scales were, I pictured someone standing on it being sold. And so oh, that makes sense. Was, yeah, that's like that's amazing. amazing. And so when I, I when I came back and I saw that it was cotton, the person no longer had to be there because the veil represented all of the people. Oh wow! I love that. Thank you, thank you for thank you for t for for speaking on that. That means a lot to me. I appreciate that, uh, very much so. Um, and I think I mentioned uh, that it almost I almost sort of read it as an altar, as a sarcophagus. So you can think about an ancient Egyptian stone sarcophagus. Um, yeah, it could be, I I definitely could see that. That's that, I love that that idea of someone standing on it being uh, being auctioned off. But absolutely, yeah, that's, that's powerful. powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, any other reactions to share with Kaneem? I think, uh, personally, when I saw this, this is something that, it's a large piece, but you have to take in individually, uh, like take in each scale individually. Like you said, you can't reach as a person. But then with the historical implications, personally for me, um, Louisiana, you know, when you yeah. see that, when I see this, you know, with seeing that this is a physical, historical piece, I feel so that brings on the modern implications where you said it's still something that occurs today, mm -hmm. that there's still, even though this is a historical piece that's physical, um, every day, you know, it's still uh, an actuality of slavery, of not necessarily physically being sold figuratively, and I think that's something that uh, looking at each individual's like, scale, you can picture like, this is symbolism for modern day, too. And I appreciate you saying that as a, as a young person, saying that that resonates so well, that resonates wonderfully with me because I, um, it's almost like it's something that I, I, def, I, 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 it means a lot to me, especially for young people to be able to connect with this, and especially young people that really don't know much about the history. Um, it means, it's, are, you, are you roots from Louisiana? Okay, yeah. Very much so. And if you have an opportunity, I, you can't get too close to the work, but I, I would like for people to get close enough where they could see that the scales, I mean, they're numbered. They still, you could, I mean, and I've, I've tried them out. They're functioning scales. They actually still work. They're rusted. They're very old, but they, they're iron scales, but they still are functional scales. Good question. So how they work is that um, there, there's a hook towards the center of each of the blade of the scale there. One that gets hung, uh, it gets attached to a chain and the other where you would put uh, one of the weights at the bottom and uh, the weights have are, you know, they might, might, be a, might be a 10 pound weight, might be a five pound weight. Um, and then you hang the cotton on the hooked part, on the on the hooked part of the scale itself, and you're able to, and it moves back and forth, you're able to sort of, uh, to weigh it. Um, uh, they're numbered in terms, so you can, there's a, how, what's the proper term for that? The, um, the, the measure, like the, the units? Yeah, the measured like, units. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can determine yeah, the, the weight yeah. of it. But being that a lot of, many of the people that, being that, the enslaved people that that's or or the people working in the fields, since a lot of them couldn't read or write, it's it's almost like they had no idea. Like they could, you know, they could, they had no idea. Actually, they might have worked their broken their back uh, picking this cotton and bringing it to be weighed and be lied to about how act, how much it actually weighs. 
because they, they, don't, they wouldn't know. So it could be much heavier than they're actually being told it is, and then they're paid very little for it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, um, this has been such an, an, it's an incredible opportunity to hear, have your voice in the room and have your presence here, and also to have your work here through the run of Dirty South. So um, please, everyone, join me in thanking Kaneem once again. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you.